Well, please, if you would turn to the book of Galatians again. Our text this morning, as already stated, verses uh, 4 through 6 of chapter 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God sent forth his Son. The uh, Apostle Paul is um, dealing, of course, with the, the controversy uh, concerning how that is a person is justified before God, that is. Uh, Martin Luther, the good man Luther, he deemed uh, the book of Galatians to be his favorite book in all the Bible. He didn't like the book of James because he didn't quite uh, grasp what James was getting at. James was not talking about forensic justification. He was talking about the evidence, the um, what shows, what, um, what's the evidence that you truly have been justified by faith alone apart from works. The evidence, the evidence, the evidence was what James was looking for. Luther couldn't get his head around that, uh, so he deemed Galatians because, well, because of its subject material. He likened it to his, he called it by his wife's name, Katie von Bora. He said that he loved his wife Katie, and he said Galatians, out of all the Bible, he says, Galatians is my Katie von Bora. He loved the subject of justification by faith alone, apart from works, the very foundation of the gospel of God's salvation. So in chapter 1, you'll see that he opens up all guns blazing because the Judaizers, they want to go back to the law, to be justified by the law. And, um, and uh, well, they're going back, they're departing from uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he tells them. And so he comes at them and he's, um, he's not afraid of controversy and neither should we be when it comes to the gospel and fighting for the gospel and God's truth, beloved, we give no quarter. We come out fighting just as Paul does. And this, of course, is very important because, well, I say that evangelicalism in general today I suggest to you is, pat, is parked on the banks of the Tiber and Rome is waiting with open arms for it to come across the river and we've got Judaizers in our midst that are ready to shove us across the Tiber. Justification by faith alone, apart from works of any kind whatsoever. Grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone, apart from works. That's the theme of the book of Galatians, Paul's theme in Galatians, and our theme here today. Here in chapter 4, he likens the Old Testament church to being a child. The church was uh, a child um, under, um, under tutors, he says, uh, in chapter 3 and verse 24, where he says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. You see, there you go, justified by faith. So the Old, Old Testament church is a child, it's an heir, hasn't got the inheritance, looking forward to it, but it's a child, an heir, under tutors. Um, but now, of course, in the New Testament, we've grown up, now we're mature, now we have inherited all the blessings of God, his redemption and salvation through Christ, through faith in Christ, apart from works, apart from the law. And of course, well, verse 6, by uh, the work of God's Holy Spirit in us, regenerating us and bringing us um, to that place of being able to understand how it is that we're to live in God's house. Not under tutors anymore. 
but as mature adult grown up faith in Jesus Christ. So there's just one church, Old Testament dispensation and the new, there's just one church throughout both dispensations. In the old it's the child, in the new it's an adult one. Stephen, the martyr, Acts chapter 7 verse 38, he talks about the church in the wilderness, in the Old Testament in other words. Now the Old Testament church was subject to these elements that Paul speaks about here in verse 3. That is, the tutors, that is the principles of the moral law that God has embedded in his creation. In, um, um, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, not the law, be careful, get that, not the law in their hearts, but the works of the law written in their hearts, okay? Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Their conscience in other words, yeah? The, the work, the, the law written in our hearts, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in regeneration. Until then, all we have is the, that moral law, our consciences, testifying within us that we are morally accountable creatures, men and women before God. All men have the works, not the law, but the works of the law written in their hearts, their, their conscience testifying against them. And then there's, then there's the... Sinai law. There's the Ten Commandments, if you like. Yeah? One expounds the other. The Ten Commandments, the, the, law, the law of God, it expounds, it teaches us, it's the schoolmaster to educate our consciences. Okay? So all men are morally accountable to God. Under bondage, the Old Testament church was under bondage, says Paul here. Why? Why does he put it that way? He says because, because they were unable to keep the law. Because of the sinful nature. Of, they were conceived in sin, they were born in sin, and they live in sin until the grace of God comes to them. But now, of course, mature and now able in the New Testament dispensation, able to live responsibly in God's house, in the Father's house, by faith in Jesus Christ, not by keeping the law, no longer under tutors, under governors. The law, that was the business of the law, that was the end of the law, the goal of the law, to bring us to Christ, to fetch us to Christ. It shreds our self-righteousness and leaves us in despair and in anguish. What can I do? And then Moses points you forward to Jesus. You trust in him. That's what you do. But the Judaizers, these foolish Judaizers, then back in Paul's day and today, you've got uh, the Roman Catholic Church unchanged and unchangeable unreformable, salvation by faith and works. You've got the federal visionists, not just in the US of America, we've got subscribers to them here in the UK. Mr. N.T. Wright with the same, same damnable doctrine. And very popular too is Mr. Wright. The Judaizers they want to go back to childhood, if you like. They want to go back to being under, under tutors and governors. They don't want to be free men and women in Christ. They don't want to be mature. They don't want to live the way God wants them to live in his house. Freely, by faith in Christ, trusting in Christ for everything. So, under the theme, God sent forth his son, the incarnation, the adoption, and the liberty. 
The incarnation, verse 4, first of all. God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. The demarcation line between the Old Testament and New Testament dispensation is, of course, um, this very point in history. God sending forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Yeah. Um, at, just, at just the right time, he said, when the fullness of time was come, that is the time according to God's scale, not ours. One day with God is a thousand years, the New Testament age period, one day. The cup of the Old Testament dispensation had filled up. It was full. There was nothing to be added to it. We had the patriarchs, we had Moses, we had the prophets, and we had King David with his Psalms. Um, it was all filled up. There was nothing more to add to the Old Testament uh, dispensation and teaching. Everything was ready. The day had come. The fullness of time. And all that's done, all that's said, all that's spoken, all that's written concerning the Old Testament dispensation, all of it, all of it was set to this purpose, pointing to this time, this fullness of time, pointing to Jesus Christ coming into the world. That God would be, God would be revealed in his glory in Jesus Christ starting beginning with his incarnation made of a woman made under the law and then the new testament the new testament cup when the new testament cup filled up then he returns in glory to judge the world in righteousness but the new testament is a day from god's perspective is just one single day in which all of his work is done and is completed by his son jesus christ and when all his work is done at the end of that day midnight strikes the son of god appears to save all his elect gather in all his children his people and judge the wicked ungodly world in righteousness in that day appointed by God. So the triune God sent the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, God sent forth his Son, the triune God sent forth his Son, and this of course includes the Son's willingness in love and willingness to come. The fulfillment of Psalm 40. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. As is it written of me, I delight to do thy will. O God, yea, thy law is within my heart. I delight to go and save your people. It's the eternal counsel of God, beloved. And so it was needful that God sent forth his son made of a woman. The incarnation, yeah? born of a woman, uniting that human nature with the divine eternal nature so that we have one person, two natures, two distinct natures, not mingled, not mixed. One person, two natures, divine and human okay but a human nature without any sin for he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin the perfect son of god listen to the heidelberg catechism bear with me will you question 15 this puts it so so clearly Question 15, what sort of a mediator and deliver, deliverer then must we seek for? Answer for one who is very man and perfectly righteous and yet more powerful than all creatures, that is, one who is also very God. Question 16, why must he be very man and also perfectly righteous? 
answer because the justice of God requires that the same human nature which has sinned should likewise make satisfaction for sin and one who is himself a sinner cannot satisfy for others. Question 17. Why must he in one person also be very God? Answer that he might by the power of his Godhead sustain in his human nature the burden of God's wrath and might obtain for and restore to us righteousness and life. Nearly there. Question 18. Who then is that mediator? Um, who is that mediator who is one person both very God and really righteous man answer our Lord Jesus Christ who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption just one more question 19 whence knowest thou this from the Holy Gospel, which God himself first revealed in paradise, in the Old Testament dispensation, and afterwards published by the patriarchs and prophets, and represented by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law, and lastly, lastly, has fulfilled it by his only begotten Son, sent forth of God made of a woman, made under the law. The lawgiver comes and places himself under his own law and meets and fulfills its every demand for us on our behalf from creator to creature to obey explicitly, perfectly where Adam failed and that righteousness is reckoned to each and every child of God, every man, woman, and child who trusts in Jesus Christ, apart from any works of theirs. Eternally appointed to be the mediator of God's people, to bring those who were eternally elected by God, chosen from before the foundation of the world, lost in sin and the darkness and misery of sin in this world, just like all the rest, but chosen of God before the world began. And to bring them, sent to, to bring them to God as his heritage. Beloved in Christ, that's what you are. You're God's heritage. Because of what Christ has accomplished. He came not just at the opportune time, or it was opportune, politically, physically, every which way, it was an opportune time. But he came in the fullness of time. He came God's time to take the place of sinners condemned under the righteous judgment of God. And to pay the price to set us free. Turn back a page to chapter 1 and verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. This present evil world from the beginning to the end. From Adam right to the very end till when Jesus comes again. It's like a mighty river full of all the quagmire of human sin. Think about it like the, the mighty Mississippi River. Starts as a trickle up in Minnesota, runs down all the way through the US of, of America, getting wider and deeper as it goes, and then at the end it plunges into the Gulf of Mexico. That's this present evil world in which we exist, in which we live now. And as it travels, as it goes towards the end of the age, it's filling up with all the excrement of human sin. And it's heading towards the end, not the Gulf of Mexico, but a great precipice over which and down into the damnation of hell. We go. But Jesus came, he gave himself 
to rescue us, to deliver us, to get us out of that swamp. Made of a woman, took our nature and dove himself into that swamp to get us out of it. Without himself being tainted, touched and all by the swamp himself. Yeah. That's what he was sent for for. That's what he came for, willingly, lovingly came for, to rescue us, to get us out of that swamp, and to set us free. What Paul's talking about here is the objective of the atonement that he has made, the consequences of the atonement that he has made, God's purpose in redeeming us, his people, from sin and from judgment, and this is the purpose, to place us in his family, to adopt us so that we're children of God, we're family members of the triune God. Came unto his own, but his own received them not, but to as many as received them, he gave the power, the right to become children of God through the Son of God, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem us, to rescue us out of that swamp of sin, to wash us, to cleanse us, to purify us, to reckon us perfectly righteous so that we can live in God's house freely as his children, not because of any merit in you or I, not because of anything we've done, not because we're in church, not because we say prayers, read the Bible, not because of anything that we have done, no works at all. Faith alone. Faith, trusting in Jesus, wretched, righteous, and a child of God. Secondly, adoption, verse 5, uh, he says, um, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. His purpose in sending his son under, under tutors, uh, under law, uh, under the, 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 the moral law embedded in, in the universe and all mankind and, and God's sinaitic law, we needed to learn. We needed to learn how justification comes. Hence the law. That's the purpose of the law, to teach us how that we are justified through, through faith in the promised seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. Made of a woman, made under the law, the seed of the woman. Yeah. The law cursed Israel's disobedience up one side, then down the other. It was like a fierce, nasty, think of the nastiest schoolmaster you could possibly think of. He's got a big stick in one hand and a belt in the other. And every time you go wrong, you get whack, whack, whack. That was the church in the wilderness. That was the church under the Old Testament dispensation. The law cursed Israel's disobedience. They were like in a prison. Those who stayed there, that is. But of course, the elect in the Old Testament dispensation, God's, God's own people, and that was only a remnant in national Israel, they, they only, they clung to the promise of Christ's coming and were thus justified. They were justified just the same way as we are. We look back to Christ's coming and what he accomplished and we are justified by trusting in him. They looked forward to his coming. They believed the promises that came to them through the word of God, through the patriarchs and the promise, the prophets, and they, they trusted in the coming Savior and they were likewise justified. They were set free just the same as you and I. But by Christ coming under the law, he did this. He took full responsibility for keeping the law of God perfectly. Yeah? Absolutely perfectly. Responsible 
took responsibility for keeping the law for me. Huh? For every child of God in this room. I will keep the law of God for them. And I will keep it perfectly. Think of the, the nth degree of the law. He comes to John the Baptist and John the Baptist says to him, No, 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 uh, you baptize me. No, says the Lord Jesus. No, no, not possible. John, you're a priest in the line of your father. You know that's not right. You know that I need to be baptized by another priest. And what age is when he, age is he, when he comes to John the Baptist? He's 33 years of age. That's the age at which a priest begins his ministry. Not before, not a day before, not a day after. He comes at the age of 33. He comes to John the Baptist, the priest. And why does he say this? Why does he demand this? Because, John, all righteousness must be fulfilled. If he doesn't, he's a sinner like you and I and me. Can't satisfy for our sins. He must keep it all perfectly. That's exactly what he did. He did what we cannot do. So now I don't live a performance-based life anymore. And I hope you don't. Yeah? I mean, you know, the thinking, well, I can't go to the... I, I sinned, I can't go to the prayer meeting tonight. I've sinned this week, so I, I can't take the Lord's Supper this, this coming Lord's Day. Performance, performance-based life. Yes, you can. That's the time when you should go to the prayer meeting. That's the time when you should come to the Lord's table. That's what's meant by self-examination. I'm ungodly, I'm unrighteous. I need to come to the Lord's table. I need Jesus. And that's what I'm coming for. The means of grace. Jesus did it all for me. So I come to the prayer meeting. I come to the Lord's table. And I come absolutely perfectly. Not myself. In Christ. He did it all for me. Yeah? Secondly... All our guilt was imputed to him. Every ounce of guilt that we carry, that we bear, it was all heaped upon him on that cross. All the curses that was due to us, all the wrath that was due to us. Think of all the hellish agony that he bore all his life and then particularly upon the cross. The curse drove hell down upon him the Son of God. Uh, Galatians 5 and verse 13. Um, no. Sorry, 3 verse 13. Uh, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The hanging signifies what? He's not fit for heaven and he's not fit for earth. They cried away with him, crucify him. He's not fit to live. John chapter 19. He went into death, through death, into hell. He bore hell upon his own body on that cross. He endured the cross. Under the law, under the full penalty of the law. That's what we deserved. He took for us. He kept the law perfectly, perfectly. Already said that, but I say it again, why? Because there's a, pa a pastoral implication here. Even in his suffering, even in his forsakenness, even there, still obedient, still clinging, still my, and the emphasis is on my, my God, my God. 
You're forsaking me, but I'm not forsaking you. I'm holding on to you. I'm clinging by my fingernails, by my teeth, but I'm not letting you go. The pastoral implication is when you're in darkness, when you feel deserted, maybe I don't know a child of God, maybe a woman, a young woman, sitting on a sidewalk somewhere in Ukraine today, cradling her dead child in her bosom. And she's asking herself, where is God in this? Hmm? Where is God in this? There are times when a child of God suffers for reasons known only to God, suffers times of desertion. What do you do? How do you cope with that? This is how you cope with it. In the blackness and darkness of it, you worship God. You cling to him. My God, my God, you are forsaking me, but I'm not forsaking you. You do exactly what the Son of God. But you say, oh, but he was the Son of God. Me, I'm just me. He did that for us. He did that for us so that you through him can do the same. Trust God, cling to him, hold to him, even in the darkness, despondency, depression, whatever it is, you cling to him. And you remember, he was there before you. He bore all that for you. He did that for us. So that his obedience, his obedience his sacrifice is perfect, is complete. And he, not we, earns for his people a place in the family of God. Not by merit, not by works. Adopted into the family of God and liberated from our slavery. From the governors and tutors. Predestined having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Legally adopted, conceived in sin, born in sin, depraved like all others, children of wrath, children of the devil, but by the sovereign, unmerited grace of God, kindness of God. Out of, it, out of it, his sovereign election, no works at all, we are given the right, the power to become children of God. And here's another thing too. In regeneration, he conforms us. I don't know if you've ever adopted any children. I adopted two. And I tell you, they could live as long as Methuselah did, but they will never be like me. In regeneration, God not only adopts us, but he conforms us to the likeness of his son. Not physically, spiritually. The restored image of God that Adam lost for us. So now, once again, we are Im image bearers of God. Now we're mature. Now we're free to enjoy our inheritance. You're free to be happy, beloved. No, not a total release from the law. Not free to be lawless. Justified by the blood of Jesus. Adopted into the family of God. And energized and enabled by the Spirit of God to keep the law imperfectly, albeit... But not out of a legality, not because of some fierce schoolmaster, but out of love, because we love him, because he first loved us. That's why I strive to keep the law imperfectly. Thirdly, the liberty of verse 6. And because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Eternally pressed, predestined, established in time, God's time, objectively at the cross, subjectively by the work of God's Holy Spirit, 
the spirit of his son, the spirit of God's son, that is the spirit of Christ. Yeah? Christ is given the spirit at the time of his exaltation. In Acts chapter 2 verse 33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear, the Holy Spirit. The Son returns to heaven, to glory, he's exalted and the Father, seeing that he has accomplished everything given him to do, he gives him the promise, the promise of his Spirit for his people and Jesus pours out the spirit upon his church upon his mature church by which he applies all the riches and all the blessings of his work that which he he accomplished in his work and as as as, as the son he makes us sons by the holy spirit in our hearts says paul now some of the modern versions, it's not pointed, but it's, well, some of the modern versions, they translate, you know, like John 3.16, they say, you know, like uh, God's one and only son. Yeah, that's not right. They need to correct that. God's only begotten son. Why? Why? Well, because he's not God's only son. That's wrong. He's the natural son. He's the son of God by eternal generation. Yes, he's the natural son. I'm a son by adoption. So are you. He has many sons. Only one natural. The rest adopted. So the Old Testament pictures, you see, they passed away. Childhood. That's how, that's how you teach a child. You don't teach a child by propositions. They don't get propositions. You show them, you show them pictures, you get a, a book and you show them, you know, that's an elephant, that's a kangaroo, that's a tiger. You show them pictures, yeah? That's how you teach a child. But now, now we've arrived. Now we've grown up, now we've matured. Now, because of the Spirit's work in our hearts, we have the ability to grasp, to understand the propositions of God's Word. And by the self-same spirit, we, we, we share in the anointing of Jesus. Now we're all together, prophets, priests, and kings. Sending forth the spirit into our hearts, because the heart's the very center. It's the very basis and the foundation. It's from where springs all the issues of life. It's the workshop of all the activity of our life. Uh, that which cometh out of a man, says Jesus, out of the heart that is, defiles the man. For from, in, out of, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Heart's either corrupt and sinful or is holy and good. But the work of God begins in the heart. Regeneration. The breath of life. Yeah? Made alive in Jesus. And bringing, bringing on, on, on his train, bringing everything necessary, everything needful us for us to enter into the family of God. The gifts of repentance, the gift of faith, sanctification, everything. Covenant of grace, of God is it's like a it's like a great big parcel. God throws this parcel into our laps, you know, and, and we open it up and we find there are all kinds of gifts in it. There's salvation, there's justification, and there's sanctification, there's repentance, there's everything that we need. It's all there. Given, 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 freely given, not worked for, a gift. And it's a gift that he never, never takes back. It's a covenant of grace. It's an inviolable bond. Yeah. Given and given forever. An inviolable bond 
of friendship with the triune God through faith in Jesus Christ. And all of it testifying to Jesus Christ within our hearts. Confirming and assuring and comforting us that we are children of God. Yeah? So that we can cry, Abba, Father, that's a New Testament blessing. You never find anyone in the Old Testament addressing God as Father. My Father in heaven. And what a father, eh? What a father. Especially if you had a, maybe had a nasty, nasty natural physical one. A loving, loving heavenly father who hath bestowed his love upon us never to remove it from us again. And by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah? That's the end. That was the goal of the law. That's what the law was given for. I say it again. Shred your self-righteousness. No, you're not a good person. No, you're not okay in yourself. But you can go back to Moses, you know. You, you go back to Moses if you want. But I tell you, he just leaves you in utter and absolute despair. He just show you your sin. That's all he can do. That's he can take you no further than that. Just keep telling you about your sins, telling you what a vile, wretched creature you are. Want to go back there? By grace alone, through Christ alone, faith alone, apart from works, apart from any merit of yours or mine. But the Judaizers then in Paul's day and the Judaizers today, they want to take us back there from whence we came. Chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him, from him. He's talking apostasy, yeah? You're departing from the Lord Jesus Christ who saved you, who liberated you. Who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is no gospel at all. Beloved in Christ, you add or you subtract from the gospel. You annul the gospel. You make it void. In chapter 5 and verse 2, Paul says, um, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You go back to the law, Christ's of no good to you at all. Yeah? You're left on your own. You've got nothing left. You're saying Christ is not enough. I've got to add something to this. What a blasphemous thought. The Son of God didn't do enough. I have got to contribute something to this. Justified by grace. Not one ounce, not a whit, is given on the basis of merit worth, nationality, works, or anything else. Grace alone, I intend to say this by the grace of God with my dying breath. Grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. Apart from any works, any works at all, believing, Trusting in Jesus Christ. To him, to him give all the prophets witness. Patriarchs, Moses, the prophets, all of them. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, Jesus, whosoever believeth in him shall receive 
the remission of sins and God's full salvation members of his family for time and for eternity never to be separated from his love again hold on to Jesus and ride out the storm hold on to Jesus trust in him he has done it all nothing for us to do but live for him love him serve him enjoy him praise him worship him the son of god sent forth of a woman made of a woman made under the law to redeem us to rescue us from that swamp i don't know about you but i'm not going back into that swamp i'm carrying on with jesus and i recommend you do too. Amen.